frustrated. frustrated. I'm Ryan Whedon. I'm... I mean, <laughs> that's Ryan Whedon. I'm Matt that's Fisher. Matt Fisher. Yeah. It's been a long week. And so much so that you, uh, you're trying to persona me. And <laughs> I like to think of it as being John Malkovich in you. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's been hot here in Seattle. It's been breaking 81 degrees. Yeah. Jeez. Which, you know, if you're a native here, it's just sauna. We're not, uh, we're not used to that. You're like Moses in the Sahara here. <laughs> we're fair weather plants. <laughs> Yeah, in this in this area, we're, we're all indoor plants that need indirect light. Yeah, <laughs> but thank God it's summer. I do love summer. Do you? I do. I don't. No. I mean, I like the idea of summer, but I'm more of a, a transitional season man. Mm, mm-hmm. Spring and and fall are, mm-hmm. de- are definitely. I like them equally. I would say. Yeah. Um, you only need a light jacket. True. And for my specific body type, I feel like clothes help. <laughs> uh, less clothes is not a good look on me. It's like the best sort of like attire is like, you know, long pants, uh, you know, t-shirt, jacket, ski mask. Mm-hmm. Like okay. that's when I'm looking the best. I think uh, I think you're being a little bit hard on yourself. Um, more of a, a, a balaclava <laughs> would, would suffice. But like when I saw you at Pony during Pride, I mean, you had like the deep cut sort of tank top going on. Was it that I wasn't wearing the uh, crop top that day? Well, I just remember when I saw you and I said hi, like I just grabbed you by where your love handles would be <laughs> if you had them. And I was just like, Ryan! <laughs> and it was all clammy and uh, <laughs> sticky. Yeah, it, it was basically like... From grenadine. <laughs> Yeah, it was basically like grabbing a sticky bag of mayonnaise. Yeah. <laughs> That's maybe the nicest a, a thing wet, you've said cool to me. Sack of mayonnaise. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm just kidding, listeners. Ryan does not have an ounce of celluloid. <laughs> uh, you can't make soap out of me. <laughs> Matt, I have something I'm super excited about that I want to talk about. Do tell. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to Tacoma to meet Lil Bub, the famous internet cat. So, you know, Ryan, I'm not as hip as you are. You might have to explain what Lil Bub is. Well, Lil Bub is a, uh, an, a cat that became famous on the internet six or seven years ago okay and she uh she has a whole bunch of genetic problems but she is the cutest thing her what? is there a specific meme that i and our listenership might identify there was a picture well the thing that made her famous was there was a picture of her just sitting on the ground that po- got posted to, to tumblr and because her jaw is short her tongue always sticks out okay also she doesn't have any teeth um, and it, somebody photoshopped in an ice cream cone, so it looked like she was eating an ice cream cone, and the photo just went insane, and so she's turned into, uh, a huge internet cat celebrity, uh, along the lines of, like, a grumpy cat or something like that. So this is a regional cat celebrity. No, this cat is from Indiana. Oh. Yeah, and she does tours, or, like... Oh, my God! <laughs> I've been a big fan of Bub for a while, and I'm finally being able to meet her is a real thrill for me. Uh, I'm looking at this picture right now. Oh. <laughs> She's six pounds. <laughs> Tiny little thing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh. Isn't she adorable? I feel like it's a meme to take them out on tour. <laughs> Apparently she has a bone, uh, some weird genetic bone disease that causes weird calcifications or something in her bones. But the vibrations from traveling in cars and, and planes and trains actually helps break up some of those little calcium deposits. So oh. it's good for her to travel. Oh, okay. Um, also, uh, Mike, her owner, is really great at like doing, when they do these meet and greets, the majority of the money that uh, they raise goes to like uh, funding pet adoption agencies and things like that. So, Okay, <laughs> morally, you've made the wise choice. <laughs> 
I'm not going to say how much I paid, <laughs> but let's just say I am glad I didn't splurge and get that massage at Banya 5 after Pride. <laughs> Anyway, I'll report back next week and let you know how amazing it was. Yeah, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. God, I wish I had something exciting on the horizon. Well, before we get to the future, did you watch anything in the past this week that was good? I rewatched Inside Lewin Davis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw it in theaters. That was the last time I saw it. And I remember liking it and mm -hmm. enjoying it. But man, a couple of years and a couple, you know, major life experiences later, and that movie really kind of spoke to me a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, most Coen Brothers films are sort of about people dealing with uncertainty. Sure. And I don't know, there was something about it. I'm watching it this time, and it just really kind of grew on me. And like, I looked at it in a very different light this time around. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you. Uh do you feel like it's a happy ending or a sad ending? Well, the, the, they, the, I mean, they like uncertainty so much that that lends itself to ambiguity. Yeah. Um, but I think overall, the way that I interpreted the ending this time was that he was going to be able to do better at life huh. <laughs> going forward. See, okay, so this is interesting because uh, I've only seen the movie once, and I remember watching it and being like, what a downer, he's mm. going to go kill himself after this. <laughs> like, that's, that was my feeling. And I remember talking to about the movie with another friend, and him saying how excited he was for the character at the end of the movie, and I was like, what are you talking um, about? And he's like, oh, because, you know, the folk scene's about to blow up, and then he's going to get discovered, and da-da-da-da-da, mm. and I was like... Wow, oh, yeah. I didn't get that at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is definitely one way to, like, look at it. I mean... To, to go into, like, the uncertainties of the movie, like, they have, like, the Schrodinger's cat problem all over that movie, including, sure. like, when he has to leave the cat in the car where John Goodman had, like, overdosed on heroin. Right. And so, like, if he leaves it here, the cat might die. Right. But it might not. Like, it has, like, that level of uncertainty, like, running through the whole movie. Yeah. So I guess to have an ending like that that's super ambiguous really sort of, I think, speaks to how well they portrayed the themes of the movie throughout. It's definitely one of the better Coen Brothers movies, I'd say. You know, I thought it was sort of a, a middle good one. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think they only have, like, two bad films and, like, 12 good to great films. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of thought this was, like, in the like the good region. Okay. But watching this somewhere else, I'm like, no, I think this is actually, like, one of their great films. Yeah. I like it. I like it a lot. So... I guess Casey Affleck auditioned for the role of Lewin, oh. and one of the prerequisites was that you had to be able to play guitar, and he did not, but he lied and said that he did, and then he was called in an audition, like, handed a guitar, and was asked to play something, <laughs> and so he just, like, started, like, improvising, like, he didn't know how to play, so improvising on an instrument that you don't know how to play... For three minutes. <laughs> and then, like, he just left. <laughs> he was just like, I'm not getting this part. Wait, wait, hold on. So I was just surprised at how much I had to kind of reevaluate my previous opinion on that movie. Yeah. I watched the movie too. Um, I watched Birth. Finally got around to watching that. Oh, okay. Yeah. What'd you think? I haven't seen it in a long, long time. It's, uh, it's an. It's a real interesting movie. Because I don't think it's necessarily a good movie. Sure. Because, you know, Anne Heche is in it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just surprised that he's able to keep that, that topic riveting for an mm. hour and a half. You know what I mean? And I think a large part of that is also Nicole Kidman's performance. Yeah, she's really good in it. Um, because that, that's a... I was imagining reading that script and thinking of yourself in that role, and I would, I would pass. Oh, yeah? Because that's... I can't imagine trying to act that. It seems too hard. Okay. Like, she really is... Because if you're, you're... You've got this balance of, like... Okay, I have to be, like, looking at this person and falling in love with them, and it's a 10-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. Like, ugh, that's real difficult territory to tread. You mm -hmm. know? And she, I think she nails it. I think mm. it's a really great performance. Mm. Um, but... I don't know. It's it, It's not... Yeah, I wouldn't it's just say, not a great movie, and I don't. I can't yeah. put my finger on why. I felt like it, it kind of because it dispelled the mystery, kind of dispelled the fun and the intrigue of the movie. Yeah, 
I do like it, and I like the ambition of making this movie because it's definitely like subject matter that I wouldn't want to touch with a ten foot pole. Yeah, but like they, uh, he goes for it, and um, and he's. And- Capable, super capable director. Yeah, and I remember I saw an interview with Nicole Kidman where someone asked her, just sort of like, oh, what was it like working with Jonathan Glazer? And it, it was definitely like this in France, like, he's a music video director. What's it like working with one of those? And she goes, I don't want to be glib about working with Jonathan because he's such like an intelligent, smart, cinematic director. Yeah. I don't want to sum up what it was like working with him into a sentence. And then that, of course, translates to frosty bitch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But at the same, like, for me, like, I see that response and that just, it sort of builds the intrigue that, like, he is sort of, like, a big thinker. Yeah. And that he really works with the actors. And, yeah. You know, and... I do like, I like all three of the feature length films he's made. Yeah. I like a lot of his commercials and short films too. But Yeah, yeah. Um, those, those are a lot of fun. This was just a, a real beguiling one that I don't know if I can recommend it to people. So you say the word beguiling. Uh-huh. Which is how I described the movie that we're talking about today. What movie's that, Matt? So everyone knows that Francis Ford Coppola is a great director. But what this movie presupposes is maybe he isn't? <laughs> Today's movie is called Twixt. It is, at least as of this recording date, Francis Ford Coppola's most recent film. And it's sort of a horror movie, in a way, so to speak. I, uh, man, do you remember when we did um, the Batman double feature, the yeah, Joel Schumacher sure. one? And we, we, there was that scene where Jim Carrey... I don't Carrey, like where this, <laughs> this is leading, but continue. Where Jim Carrey's character, the Riddler, had that, like, uh, Zoltan machine that had a, a no to question mark scale. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think this movie breaks that scale, because it kind of just goes in both. I don't know how to feel. So, I saw this a couple years ago, and I remember my boyfriend at the time caught, like, the last ten minutes of it, and I could tell that he wasn't digging it. (laughs) And then the credits came on, it was written, directed, produced, Francis Ford Coppola, and he goes, really? (laughs) Really? He's like, this looked terrible. It looks like a 19-year-old's first feature length. So, uh, Starring Val Kilmer. <laughs> Pudgy Val Kilmer, too. <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Francis Ford Coppola. Okay. Francis Ford Coppola got his start making schlocky horror movies. Right. He went to the, the Roger Corman School of Filmmaking. His first feature-length movie is called Dementia 13. Mm -hmm. It's a movie where neither the words Dementia nor 13 are ever (laughs) mentioned. Uh, And it's a total rip-off of uh, Hitchcock, like, specifically, like, Notorious and Psycho and Rebecca. Like, it's basically if you put all those movies together and reduce production values, that's what Dementia (laughs) 13 is. Okay. It's still a lot of fun, but yeah. So, like, he got his start making schlocky horror movies... For, Fran- uh, for Roger Corman. And Roger Corman has this great sort of uh, anecdote about Francis Ford Coppola once he was out making his own movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, Roger Corman, you know, King of the Bees, made, made, produced and directed hundreds of bee movies. Right. Still today? Yeah, he does like the Sharknado yeah. franchise. Say, he's still around, I think. <laughs> uh, he's a super interesting guy, though. If you ever get a chance to read anything that he writes or says... I highly recommend reading okay. it. He's a very articulate, very intelligent person. So he was talking about Francis Ford Coppola and making Godfather Part Two, And Roger Corman's in it. He plays one of the senators. Oh, wow. There's a, a Senate hearing with Michael Corleone where he's brought up in right. front of everyone. And Roger Corman shows up on set and he, you know, Francis Ford Coppola had asked him to be 
part of this. Okay. And he looks around and he sees that all the other people playing senators, except for the Nevada senator, who's like a, one of the big characters in Godfather Part Two. Right. He's a professional actor. Everyone else was a producer, a director, a writer, or an editor. All the other like congressmen on playing or people playing congressmen or senators on the panel were in like the Hollywood industry or in the movie show business of some sort, but behind the camera. Okay. And so he asked Francis Ford Coppola, he's like, I know a lot of these people. None of them are professional actors. And Coppola said that he was watching Senate hearings on TV one day to get an idea of what this should be like. Uh And he said that all the senators seemed very well informed, very smart, very educated on the, the topics at hand. Sure. But they all looked a little uneasy on camera. Mm. And that is the level of sensitivity that is nowhere in this movie. <laughs> like, I, I, I think, like, it's it's those sorts of decisions that puts that, like, ineffable quality into movies like The Godfather, Godfather yeah. Part Two, Apocalypse Now, Conversation. The Conversation. Yeah. Uh, that's just nowhere in this Absolutely. movie. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot of like, oh, that's good enough. You know? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to look this up, but I didn't have time. So there's something weird with the aspect ratio of this. It's not just a standard widescreen. Watching it on my television at home, oh. I notice that there's still like bars on the top and bottom and like <laughs> The aspect ratio is like 11.4 or something like that. Oh, God. And, and I feel like someone just accidentally like put the film through a paper shredder. <laughs> and it's like, well, this is our new aspect ratio. Because <laughs> there's certain scenes, like uh, near the beginning, like in the hardware store, where it seems to be framed just a little bit too low. Yeah, like, I noticed that too. Like, what's his name? Bruce Dern is, yeah. is, uh, is feels always really awkward in, in frame. Yeah, and it's like, he, yeah, it's like he leans over that desk and I'm like, it looks like the camera just meant to be like <laughs> aimed a little bit further down, but it's not. Wow. And like, you know, sometimes you could make the argument like, oh, well, this is his way of, like, showing that this town is off-center or that's something like that. That's what I like chalked that. it up to. But, and I think that's what, when I originally watched this, was, like, going through my mind with these, that these were, like, artistic decisions. <laughs> Rewatch, I'm like, that was a mistake, and he just did not care. <laughs> uh, did you see that thing? So this is kind of something that I think Clint Eastwood is suffering from, too. Or okay. I think it's just, like, maybe old director syndrome, okay. where, like, what was the movie American Sniper? Yeah, he has. There's a scene where there, where Bradley Cooper's cradling a fake baby, and they just have like wah, wah, sounds going on, and it looks like a fake baby on okay. on the screen. And it's like, did he just not catch that? Did he just not care? Oh, like, okay. is it? Did he just believe that? Like, oh, audiences will believe it anyway. And I I kept thinking about that while watching this movie. Was like, <laughs> did he just think we weren't going to notice some of these things? <laughs> like, What's, what's going on? So the premise of Twixt, I guess I should say, yeah. Hal Baltimore, played by Val Kilmer, is sort of a, a you know, the a bargain basement author. Stephen King. They say bargain basement Stephen, Stephen King. King. Yeah, yeah, it's like he probably writes, you know, the paperbacks that you see in, like, the uh, circular stands, like yeah. Fred Meyer, you know. Or like... Uh, Ones that were promoted for uh, a week at the Hudson News in the airport and then immediately went to paperback. So, and his speciality is, like, witches. Right. He he writes a bunch of novels about witches, and he's on some sad little book tour, and he stops in... What was the name of the town? Swan Lake, with two N's. (laughs) Wait, was it Swan Lake? Or Swan Swan something. Swan Valley? Maybe Swan Valley. Yeah, Swan Swan something. Lake is, an, is a ballet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Swan something. And they don't even have a bookstore there. Right. So he has to do his book signing in a hardware store. Which the manager was okay with, apparently, and got him a table and everything. Yeah. Because they have a book section in the hardware <laughs> store. And, you know, nobody gives a fuck about his book. What except this... for the sheriff, <laughs> who's a big, big fan. Real, real quick, the, the, the first person that he talks to uh, in, the, in the hardware store 
was, I don't know if you noticed, shopping for a plunger. I thought, interesting choice there. Of all the things you could be buying in a hardware store, this this first character has a is getting a plunger. He's got a, a, a shit problem. Yeah. <laughs> He's got to unclog some shit. <laughs> it's like, oh no, I can't stop to talk about books. I got to go unclog the shitter. Man, we should have had that guy working on this movie. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, a lot of my experience with this movie dates back to when I first watched it because I came away from it not knowing how to judge it. Yeah. Because there are parts of it that seem sort of, I don't want to say expertly crafted, but crafted by someone who seems to be know, seems to know what they're doing. Right. It seems to be in capable hands. What were some of those moments, just for example? <laughs> So, just like the the color coding, like some of the, the dream sequences were very, you know, visually ravishing, I guess I should say. Okay. You know, the kids cutting the lemons and things like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, or just walk into the hotel in his sort of dream state. Okay. Um, things like that. Like, there, there seemed to be great attention to detail to these things that really don't seem to have any rhyme or reason in the grand scheme of things. Uh -huh. But, you know, so he, Francis was born into the cinematic world making schlocky B-horror movies, and that's how he's choosing to die. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that's fine. If that's where his heart is, if he wants to just make horror movies, like, you know, sort of modern day Mario Bava type stuff. That's cool. I can dig it. Like his I feel that his uh Dracula movie is is the best adaptation of the novel. I do like that movie too, actually. And you know, he insisted on only using like practical effects in that movie. Mm -hmm. Like there's no computer wizardry in that one. It's all, you know, effects that you could have done thirty years prior sure. and stuff like that. Uh and you know, maybe that's just where his heart is in, the, in like, the grand scheme of things. Like, that's the type of movie that, like, you know, maybe him watching old Mario Bava and, you know, horror films back in the day is what got him interested in making movies. Mm -hmm. So now he just wants to spend his career making those movies that got him excited as a youth. Okay. I don't think this hit that target. <laughs> I was, I mean, there was a certain point in this when I was, when I was watching it, just thinking like, what is the aim here? <laughs> like, cause it's not really entertaining in my mind. It's not really frightening. It doesn't make me think, you know, it's... I just, I'm really, I just don't understand quite what his, what his goal was as in making this. Like when I read a little bit, like there's some snippets of him talking about it. It's just like, oh, I had this dream and I thought that'd make a great movie. And, you know, just like. Sometimes talking about a dream you had is really boring to other people. <laughs> uh -huh. Like, I kind of felt that that was a little bit how, how I took this. Like, I, I, I'm not interested in your, in your, you know, fear of goth kids across the lake, you know? <laughs> the crow fans <laughs> across the lake. Jesus. They're really, like, they didn't really play out into anything. Like, there was the kids across the lake that were all, like, goth and the townspeople thought they would like worship satan yeah and like they go and talk to him at some point but like in the grand scheme of things they don't actually seem to play they don't out do anything in, except in, like save the save l fanning the one mo the one on the v. motorcycle yeah me uh but yeah even that was sort of like an ethereal like it, we don't yeah. know if it was a reality thing or not and i'm willing to give this movie a little bit of leeway in the in terms of like well, there is some dream logic going on. Uh, so, you know, I'm willing to forgive some things like that. Maybe they're just like a manifestation of like old person fear of teenagers. Sure, you know? sure. Like, that's fine. Uh, but it really limits your audience, I guess, is my, <laughs> is my point. Um, well, part of this, it's also sort of autobiographical. Francis Ford Coppola lost his kid in... Right. An accident. In the same way. Yeah. Decapitated by a tow line. Yeah. But so, doesn't that feel kind of icky to you? Like, yeah. It, are you it, using this to... So when we talked about Bound and how the, like, there was a lesbian sex scene mm -hmm. and how like when I view it now, it kind of seems less like male fantasy and more like an actual exploration of like 
their like very real like maybe still developing maybe still discovering like adult sexuality yeah and you know part of me wants to think that like he was using this movie to help explore his grief concerning it but man does it not feel that way (laughs) yeah it really felt kind of tacked on at the end yeah for me anyway yeah it was like oh this so you're so val kilmer's like your uh proxy and we were supposed to be thinking it was you the whole time yeah like is that the twist at the (laughs) end i don't know yeah there's just i mean thematically there's a lot of things that seem to start and then not have a a solid conclusion well all right one of the 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 refrain in the movie is the bell tower like the clock tower yeah but the most astonishing thing about the town was an old belfry it had a clock tower with seven faces. You could see the time from anywhere in the town of Swan Valley. But the faces persistently told different times. No question, something evil was abiding there. Part of me feels that, you know, the idea of doing that would be like, whichever way the clock whichever part of town you're in where the clock tower's facing Mm -hmm. that's the time that you're in yeah that's kind of what i thought was and he kind of does that a little bit with his phone right he's like looking at them and then i think it was switching as he was walking around the tower a little bit but it doesn't actually seem to play no it doesn't anything because that was like my first impression was like oh if he's in this part of town it's like this time right and then if he walks to a different part of town it's a different time right but I have no proof of that because the movie didn't seem to make it be that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the clock tower in general doesn't really play out in any way either. No, like he goes up into it at one point and he has that fall. Right, because then he, like his daughter is there or something. I can't yeah. remember. And it's like, oh, that's it. Yeah. Clock tower part done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's halfway into the movie and then it kind of just stops. Yeah. Maybe two thirds into the movie. Yeah, it's... I don't know. This is definitely veering towards the question mark part of uh, the Riddler scale. I mean, the movie seems to just refuse to be anything. Like, it refuses to be a specific genre. Mm -hmm. And even when when it seems to be getting good, it almost purposely stops being good. Right. There's... There's just, like, bits and pieces where, like, the dialogue and the conversation seems to be becoming interesting and engrossing. And then they'll say one thing. Like, they'll just be, like, a single line of dialogue that seems so tacky and so, like, screenwriting 101. Yeah. <laughs> then, like, was, it, was that purposely added in? That's the, that was something I was thinking was, like... Since he's the bargain basement Stephen King, was he trying to make this kind of schlocky too? Like, is he saying that, like... Having seen almost every Stephen King movie, (laughs) I can easily say that the vast majority of them are not this level of schlocky. (laughs) Because there there are certain things, like, uh, at the beginning, there's a shot where it's, like, one of the bat houses is, like, frame, is, is in one side of the frame... And then, like, you see the shop behind it. And, like, they're both in focus. Like It's almost like a double... What is it? A, a diopic lens? Is that what Ooh, they use for double focuses? Maybe, yeah. It seems like there's a lot of that. Because so much of the movie, it seems like everything is in focus. Whether it's in the foreground or the background. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing that is drawing your eye to it in a lot of the scenes. Yeah. It's like... It just kind of flattens everything. everything yeah, it. kind of. Like, you don't know where to look, and there's no focal point to what's in frame, so it's like, if if everything is sharp and focused, how do you look at everything? Yeah. And really, like, what are you supposed to be paying attention to? Like, you're not directing our attention to something in frame. It's... You're making us watch the whole, the whole thing. thing. Yeah. And he kind of breaks his own rules that he's setting up, too, because there's, like, the, the split screen when Val Kilmer is talking to his wife, and they're, it's he sets it up so it looks like we're seeing, because they're doing, like, a Skype situation. Sure. Sets it up so it looks like when he split screens it, we're seeing the image that the other is seeing, you know? Yeah. But at one point, we see when the wife hangs up, she actually closes her computer. Oh, yeah. And so it's like... 
oh, so we weren't seeing what he was seeing the whole time? Like, it was just bizarre. And, you know, I want to be on the movie's side because there are parts, like, when he's in sort of the dream elements of the movie where I feel like it gets a good sense of atmosphere going and it it really kind of captures that, like, sort of sense of dream logic uh, mm-hmm. and just, like, the feel of, like, being in a surreal environment where time doesn't <clears throat> really have a concept and logic doesn't hold fast and strong. Yeah. Uh, but even in those dream situations, he seems to sort of ruin the mood. <laughs> I feel like, so this is something I was thinking about too, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but like in, like if there was a remake or if this idea in a different director's hands, I think actually could be kind of cool. Like the idea that you go to the dream world and then things don't make sense and it's illogical, but then in the real world, like you're starting to slowly see things mirror what's going on in your dream world. Um... Like, it could be a real thriller, you know? But, it, like, it never reaches that point. Well, because you see... It's too st- overstuffed. Well, you see in a lot of movies where it's, you know, something strange happens to a character and then it cuts to them waking up in bed and it's like, sure. was that a dream or did that actually happen? Sure. But in here, it's... They very make it literally, like, oh, that was a dream. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, well... they It starts to ask the question, like, does what happened in dreams have a... Uh, uh, sort of consequences in real life. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the question that it asks that never gets answered. Because it just, it puts out all these themes, like it's gonna be leading up to something huge, or that it's, it's, it's very challenging in a way. Like, it almost seems like you couldn't accidentally make a movie this challenging. Like, he seems to have a grasp of all these, like, filmmaking tools, mm-hmm. and he's, he's, like, asking you these questions that, like, an informed viewer, like, someone who's seen, like, a lot of horror, or even, like, a lot of art house, because this kind of has a blending of the two, mm-hmm. but then he doesn't, f- like, follow through or care if anything's answered. Yeah. And I'm not sure, yeah, and I'm not sure where this problem really lies is it like is this a screenwriting problem like it needed to go through a couple more rounds of editing (laughs) yeah or is this like you know a director's problem where he wasn't telling us the story properly while filming it well i was thinking back to when uh the gayish guys were on here and kyle Getz was talking about how we always put like both blame and praise on the director. Yeah. But in this case, it was written, directed, and produced by Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> so it's like, really, this is the baby. majority <laughs> of the blame does go on to one person. Yeah. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of weird, sort of schlocky script problems that. And it's just stupid stuff that that's tropey that that drives me nuts. And it seems like he like he, when he runs into Edgar Allan Poe in his dreams, and he goes, oh "My God, Edgar Poe, show me the way." Or like just stupid things like when he calls the sheriff to be like, "I'd I love to write that book." Write that book with you. And the sheriff doesn't say a thing, just hangs up the phone, and then goes to meet him. And then later, like, that part where he sneaks into the morgue, and then he, like, sneaks behind the stupid, bumbling police officer, like, tiptoeing, and then pretends he just walked in, is like, oh, knock, knock, yeah. yeah. and the guy's like... Sheriff's over at your motel, and he said, I'll only be here another 30 minutes. Okay, bye. And it's like, so you just came by to say hi, or, like, there's no explanation as to why you were even pretending to be there, like... I don't know. There's just... The motivations of these people are so bizarre. And what... I mean, like... What was the sheriff's deal anyway? Like, was he just, like... His M.O.? Like... Yeah. So was he the murderer? Yeah. So he was the murderer. Well... And V was a vampire all along? Well, all right, all right. <laughs> this this is where we're, we're getting into to hard stuff, because we don't know... Even on rewatching... I'm... Judging from the very last scene of the movie, mm-hmm. I struggle to to sort of uncover 
like the the idea that I have is the movie starts out reality mm-hmm. and somewhere along the line between like dream and reality it becomes the story that how Baltimore's writing okay and because the very last scene of him at the publisher it's him it's selling the story <laughs> yeah and which leads me to believe that at least a portion of what we've seen previously was the story he was writing okay because we, we see the scene of Hal dying, but then we get the next scene of him at the publisher. So there's something in there where what we're seeing is the story that Hal's writing. Uh-huh. I don't know when that portion of the movie starts, or even if I'm right. Yeah. I, I mean, okay. If that's the case, like, why don't we just watch Lost Highway? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a much better movie. <laughs> Yeah, okay, and I mean, like, if if I want to give him a ton of credit, it's like, maybe that's why he's laying in all these sort of meta references, like, with the the rope killing his daughter, mm-hmm. and, like, uh, Val Kilmer, is, his wife in the movie is his actual ex-wife mm-hmm. in real life. Oh, it is? Yeah. So, like... Strange. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's his way of saying, like, ooh, think meta now. Okay. Like, I don't know. It's, it's giving him a lot of credit, is, but... Is his real-life ex-wife a professional actress? Uh, Val Kilmer's? Yeah. Yeah, they were okay. in uh, a movie together. Oh, Willow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. She's the, she's the woman from Willow. There was a woman in that movie? <laughs> I know, right? I thought it was just Val Kilmer and uh, Warwick Davis. <laughs> Willow, you idiot! Um, can, can we can we also just talk about the Ouija board scene for a second? Sure. Have Why? You ever, <laughs> have you ever used a Ouija board? Yeah. Did it work? No. It's like somebody was moving it clearly, and if it wasn't somebody else, it was me. I admit it. I moved the Ouija. Thing. Well, that's how they say a Ouija board works. Is that even if you're not consciously moving it, just the fact that there's a bunch of people holding on to a, a object, like a small lightweight object, will move it. Mm-hmm. Like you can do it with any piece of like small plastic that can easily slide across a board. <laughs> yeah. Um, so even though like people might, even if everyone is claiming like they're not moving it. Just all those people holding on to it moves it a little bit. Uh, that must be at least one of the points if your argument is to stand that it turns we're we're watching the book at that point. Okay. Because it's like it floats up. Yeah. Yeah. Sheriff, you're doing that. I can feel I'm not. I don't know. It was weird. <laughs> they don't really have much in the way of a morgue in this town. <laughs> Yeah. It, it was Why like, would they have a morgue in this tiny town anyway? It was like walking into like the uh the cold produce section in a Costco. <laughs> yeah. With the plastic flaps. So. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if this is super sterile. Like I don't know if I'd keep a cadaver in here for you know, they were doing it for like days. Yeah. They were waiting for the medical examiner yeah, or something, like but it was the weekend, I guess. Years. Yeah. I don't know. And they don't work on weekends. So don't get killed on a Saturday, folks. <laughs> this is probably the most important question I ask you about this movie. What did you think of Val Kimmer's impersonations? <laughs> I mean, cringeworthy isn't even the beginning. Let, of let, let's rank them in different categories. First, accuracy to the person that he was impersonating. <laughs> I I give him I give him a B. Like he. He kind of sounded like Marlon Brando a little bit. The fog on the lake was like the a straight edge razor. And I love his James Mason. The fog on the lake reminded me of my first wife. It dissipated with time. Now it let, let, let's it rank. Quickly becomes problematic. <laughs> <laughs> you mean his gay '60s basketball player? Uh. Didn't just tickle your funny bone. I'm typing as the basket as a gay basketball player from the 60s. Now I like short shorts. They are revealing, but they're comfortable. It helps me jump. So, all right, just based on accuracy towards the person that he was impersonating, I give I give it a good solid B. 
in terms of whether or not I felt it appropriate for the film, I'm going to have to give it, like, a double F minus. Yes. It takes me out. Like, it, it really seemed like Val Kilmer just, like, was riffing. Yeah. And Francis was like, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> this is part of the movie now. It feels completely indulgent. Apparently, so this is, uh, there was a, a thing on the AV Club about, like, you know, DVDs of The Damned or something like that. And uh, the there's a 40 minute uh, behind the scenes of it host, okay. of this movie hosted by Francis Ford Coppola's granddaughter. Oh, okay. And uh, it's mostly them just talk, walking around the grounds, being like, "And here's where we do this, and here's where we do this." Oh. But there's lots of uh, also lots of Val Kilmer doing um, his quote unquote black person voice. <laughs> And uh, I couldn't bring myself to try and find that on the internet because I'm sure it's just painful <laughs> to sit through. In 2011, he's doing that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a little little poor taste. <laughs> and poor taste for... Um, Francis? Frey for. <laughs> like, don't, don't put that in your movie, hon. Frey for cop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Frey for cop. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what to say about Edgar Allan Poe anymore. <laughs> Is he, uh, diminished in your eyes now? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. I don't know, there were certain things, like, when he meets Poe on, like, that bridge, I was like, I looked at it and I was like, oh, this reminds me a lot of some of the more, like, arty scenes in Antichrist. I was like, God, this looks so much worse. <laughs> That's the thing, Is like, he's done special effects things before he's obviously like got the budget to to make this look good and like the idea of what he was trying to get across is there but the, it just feels like a first draft you know it feels i feel like i would send the special effects team back and be like okay make this look render this a little longer guys yeah keep, try a little harder next time i don't know like it's it's never quite we're, right. We're aiming for something better than reboot. <laughs> you have you make a good point with like the lemon scene. Yeah, it's, it's really effective. And there's like one when he first goes to the hotel. There's like a cutaway he does that is kind of up, and you see that the whole carpet is red. Yeah, yeah. Like that was kind of cool. But like, there's way more misses in that department than there are hits. And in the dream one, especially like the the second one with like the lemons and things like that. I kind of feel like the he's just letting the movie be the movie. Like, he's not interrupting the movie. Like, he's doing, like, color corrections and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, A, the acting, for some reason, feels fine. Like, the uh, the minister or whoever who, like, runs the house. I'm like, oh, he's a acting like he's actually a minister. Yeah. I actually I felt like Elle Fanning was the only actor in this movie that was, like, good. <laughs> yeah, she was pretty good. She was, I, I she liked was her. fine. Like, I feel like her performance was good. Yeah. Right, you're, yeah, you're right. I mean, Bruce Jones was just doing his thing. I think he plays that same part in everything <laughs> I was going to say, he's always a little hammy. Yeah. And, like, cantankerous old weirdo. Maybe we just have a predilection to, like, the actresses in movies. Sure. But, I mean, I just feel like she did the most with, with the material she had. Okay. Everyone yeah. else was kind of subpar. Yeah. The scene where Hal Baltimore is, like, setting up his, like, writing stand. Yeah. And he's, like, got his whiskey and his pens and his laptop and it's like a ritual I'm like I'm sure all writers you know they need to have things just so mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that I go to work I get things how I want them before you start yeah same here uh but I just remember the soundtrack in that scene was really weird yeah it wasn't like it was a like movie. marimba yeah it was like some sort of like Steve Reich minimalist <laughs> drumming it was weird and I was like none of this seems in place <laughs> I, yeah, now that you mentioned it, I don't make a note about that, but it really took me out. Like, the soundtrack comes back a couple times, but I just remember it was really featured there, and I couldn't quite figure it out. Like, they really went all into his, him, like, setting up his writing stand, to him not being able to write. Rewatching this, because I, I wanted to rewatch it since I watched it initially, mm -hmm. because I, I, like, I left and I was like, I don't know what I think of this movie. I, I don't know what to make of it, I don't know how to categorize it really. Rewatching it, I firmly do not like it, <laughs> even though I was the one who chose it. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but it was basically anything that I was questioning before, I firmly put in, like, this was a misfire, this was a bad idea, or this just 
plan was executed poorly. Yeah. 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 I think you nailed it on the head with that. <laughs> with a little time I could reassess it but really this time and really quickly too like it didn't take me long before I was like no I just no we know that uh, Francis Ford Coppola is a winemaker yeah. and time doesn't always make a wine better sometimes it just turns it into vinegar. vinegar now that's a hard motherfucking fact of life but that's a fact of life your ass is gonna have to get realistic about maybe he's a better winemaker than a filmmaker now his wine's really not that great it's a little overpriced. Um, I'll say that. It's fine, but $17 for a claret? Come on. What are we paying for? That foil wrapper that goes over it? Netting, whatever it is? I mean, he's got a lot of misses in his catalog already. Like, I, oh, I shouldn't say that he's been an otherwise, like, sterling director since. How the mighty have fallen. I mean, like... There's no question that The Godfather, The Godfather Part Two, The Conversation, Apocalypse Now are pillars of American cinema. Yeah. Those are yeah. huge movies. Yeah. And Twixt is <laughs> nowhere near them. <laughs> what do we got coming up next week? Well, after that uh, beguiling horror experience, I want to do something that's kind of existential slash feel good. I think I want to watch um, True Stories. Oh, the, the David, David Byrne, Byrne movie. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right, all right. From one edge of surreal to the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's just, uh, let's cover the spectrum here in season four. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Should we plug our junk? Let's do it. Follow us on Twitter at xratedmovies. Send us an email, x.rated.movies at gmail.com. Like our Facebook page at Rated X Movies. Head on over to that iTunes, Apple iTunes store and give us a, a review or subscribe or some stars. Yeah, any, all would be much appreciated. We only have a couple and I know that I have more friends than I have reviews. <laughs> reviews are hard. It took me you know, six months to review some I was going to say, podcast. there's definitely been... There's definitely podcasts that I've listened to for months that I've not reviewed. Yeah, so, you know. But, we'll forgive uh, you on that front. No. Do it anyway. <laughs> um, and yeah. We've got, we've got you know, other ways you can reach us, reach us too. We have uh, Patreon goals now. Indeed, yeah. Come, check them out. Uh, you, can, you can throw us some bones and uh, we'll put those to good use. Promise. Yeah. Send us to the PodCon. Yeah. PodCon 2017. Get some, get some 206 represented in there. Is your phone number 206? Yeah. Okay. Mine is two. Okay. <laughs> I've had the same number since I was 16. Oh, wow. Yeah. You had a cell phone when you were 16? My grandmother bought me one when I got my driver's license because she was afraid that I'd get stranded on the freeway. <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. Yeah, so... For comparison's sake, I got my first cell phone when I graduated college. <laughs> Could be the same year. Could be, quite possibly. Thank you for listening. We'll see you here next week for uh, True Stories. David Burns' musical odyssey. Best witches, everyone. Mm-hmm.